Hey guys, what's up? So in this video, I'm going to be giving you my sort of end of year review of the MacBook Pro 16 inch. And there's a couple of reasons why I wanted to revisit this one. And that's because there's been a few things that have changed with macOS Big Sur, a few sort of software bugs that have been ironed out, and also some new ones that are absolutely driving me crazy. But obviously the landscape of MacBooks and Macs has completely changed at the moment. And we have Apple Silicon and their M1 Macs. And it just kind of redefines what sort of MacBook you should go for. So with that sort of perspective, I'm going to jump into this, tell you some of the things I absolutely love about this device and some of the things I just hate about it. So make sure you bash that subscribe button until it's no longer there. Come along for this journey and let's get started, shall we? So I'm a long-term MacBook user. I have used them for absolutely ages and I've used the iMac back in the day as well. And I really do love Mac OS and just the devices. I think they're sleek, they're pretty damn good, they're well-made and they seem to last quite a long time. Now, the device I came from was the MacBook Pro 2012 model, which was ancient. I had upgraded to a MacBook Pro, I think it was a 2017 model with a butterfly keyboard and it was just absolutely awful. So when this got announced, I was all over it because it had the new defined keyboard on there, the obviously slightly larger screen as well, and just a bit more powerful. So how does it hold up long term? Now, we'll start off with some of the things I absolutely love about it. And the first thing is it's just an all around versatile machine. So it kind of doubles up as my desktop. So I, because the screen is large enough to work off of, I've got enough real estate on there that it's just a bit of a dream to use. And then I pair it up with my iPad Pro 12.9 inch and I use Sidecar, which again, it just works seamlessly. It's like some kind of weird Apple magic that they've managed to throw in there. So having that ability to use a second monitor and take up a very little space. The next thing, and this is one of the biggest things for me, is the keyboard on this thing is just, oh, it is beautiful to use. The travel isn't quite as much as having like a dedicated keyboard or anything like that, but it's enough and it's definitely improved over Apple's abysmal butterfly keyboards. If you've used one of those before, you know what I'm talking about. And Apple did a terrible job and, you know, we had like four years of absolutely awful MacBooks and it was just horrible. But the new scissor keyboards that got introduced with the MacBook Pro 16 inch are a dream to type on. And I do a lot of typing. So for those of you who aren't aware, I also write novels in, I suppose, my spare time when I'm not YouTubing. And I, obviously that takes up a lot of writing time and I can do long sprints with that. It doesn't really get in the way of my key travel and thin. It's just a really nice keyboard to use. At first, I wasn't overly sure. It kind of felt quite similar to the butterfly keyboard, but you don't get finger fatigue like you did on the old butterfly keyboard. There's enough give and enough travel in there that it is just nice to use. The next thing that I like, and it's also actually one of my dislikes, so I'll come on to that later on, is the trackpad. It's big, it's responsive, the gestures are beautiful to use. And if you've just watched one of my other videos, I picked up a magic mouse just to kind of see if that was anywhere close and I'll have a full review for it. And it's not. The gestures on the trackpad are just, they're great. It makes using Mac OS so intuitive and easy to navigate. And there's just so many good things about it. And the next thing that I really like is the fact that you get a, a lot of power packed into this thing. You know, it's a very, very capable machine. It takes care of pretty much every single thing that I need to do, apart from gaming, because obviously it's a Mac and it just doesn't really do it. So in terms of like video editing, photo editing, doing all my thumbnail creation, it just does everything without breaking a sweat. Although I break a sweat when doing those things because it puts out so much heat, which is another thing that will come on to in my uh, absolute hate kind of section of it but it can handle pretty much anything that I throw at it and for that it is an all-around really really good work tool and when you approach this thing from that perspective that this is a work tool it's a tool that I need to be able to do my content creation my work just be able to run my website be able to do inventory management and all of that in that respect this machine is an all-around amazing tool but it is very expensive which then brings us on to some of my uh, dislikes of this device. Now, the first one is, and it's not necessarily a dislike of this device, it's a dislike of the fact that Apple have introduced M1 Silicon and their base level stuff really, really competes with MacBook Pro 16 inch. Now, this does beat out the M1 Max in certain tasks. So there's no moving away from that. I'm not some kind of Intel denier. It still is the more powerful machine. But when you can't consider that it costs sometimes, you know, two to three times more than some of the entry level Macs that you can get with silicon. It's just 
incredible what Apple have pulled off here. And actually, what I would probably rather have now in hindsight, that the MacBook Air and the new MacBook Pro 13 inch have this as a keyboard. They didn't at the time that I purchased this. But now that they do, and they're powerful, and they're really portable and lightweight, and I could use Sidecar for my 12.9 inch iPad, I would much rather have one of those for portability, just for lightweight tasks, and then have a dedicated desktop for my larger tasks, stuff that needs a big screen and all of that. And that kind of rolls into the next problem, that the M1 Macs do pretty much everything, and they compete very similarly in terms of performance with the 16 inch MacBook Pro, but they do it quietly, and they do it really, really well. This thing is far from quiet. Pretty much doing most tasks on this, the fans will spin up, and it's frustrating because it's not necessarily that you can hear them. I'm not too bothered about having an absolute silent machine. That's not something that really bothers me. But you can hear it, and the heat it puts out makes you kind of conscious about where you use the device. I use it on a desk pretty much all of the time, but previous devices I've used on my lap, or I have used when I'm in bed just doing a light bit of work and everything, but I'm always really concerned that I'm going to start covering up some of these vents. And if I did that, with the heat that this thing puts out, I'm pretty damn sure that it will, um, I don't know, blow up and kill me or something like that, and yeah. I don't want to take that risk and I don't want to damage the machine. So it's definitely one thing that I'm very conscious of and very, very envious of obviously the new Macs that are available because they do it pretty much silently and they do it without putting out too much heat. So the versatility of those machines is definitely better than this. The other things that disappoint me are, I don't know if it's software and I don't know if it's hardware. It's so hard to understand. But originally when these came out, they got a bad rep because the speakers Oof, they're beautiful, they're amazing and incredible speakers, but they pop and they do this weird distortion thing from time to time. And it was really well documented and everybody was kind of up in arms about it. Then Apple issued a software fix, which seemed to fix it. Mine originally had the issues with speakers, the software fix rolled out and fixed it. And it's back, but it's worse. So I still get that popping and distortion, but now I get this weird kind of audio distortion where it like tears as well at different levels and it drives me mad. So whenever I do any kind of audio work or from editing my videos, I always have to have headphones when I get to the audio side of things because the audio on this is just so incredibly unreliable. And there's been a couple of software updates that have come out since that started happening and they haven't addressed that issue. So I have no idea if it's just it's come back to my model or if it's just hit and miss or if I just have a hardware defect. I'm going to send it away to Apple to get them to have a look at it. Just, I don't really want to do it over the Christmas period when we have a certain virus running rampant because it's, I need this at the moment. So I don't really want to give it up just yet. But when I do, I'll be having an interesting video about me trying to do everything on my iPad, which is going to probably be absolute hell for me, but it could be enjoyable for you guys. So make sure you subscribe so you catch that. So one of the other things that I really dislike about this, and this is just, I suppose, a general thing when it comes to MacBooks, unless you go for the MacBook Air, is the touch bar. Because sometimes it's pretty good and it's pretty intuitive, but there's so many times where you go to use it and it's just, you don't have the keys available that you would like to have. Uh, you know, things like being able to open up all my applications or go into Launchpad or just kind of close a window. You just can't necessarily do it. Sometimes I've just got music controls up for some reason and I don't want music controls at those times. So it's not intuitive, it, you know, I wish there was some kind of machine learning that knew what you're going to do, some psychic machine learning. So the touch bar, I'm not a fan of. And also as well, it doesn't always respond to touch. The amount of times I've kind of tapped on it a few times before something opens up. I would much, much, much rather have just a row of function keys like on previous Macs. And especially when I started using things like the Magic Mouse 2, this is where it really became apparent because some of the gestures on the Magic Mouse are okay, but for the most part, it's a pretty rubbish device. And, you know, just being able to close all my windows and go home back to the main screen or open all my apps, because I didn't have that in the function bar because I had a touch bar instead, you can't do it. So it's really frustrating. I really, really dislike the touch bar. It's okay at times, but for the most part, it just seems pointless and tacked on and probably driving the cost up of these things, which I'd much rather have a cheaper cost. And one of the other things that really drives me mad, and this is, I suppose, less of an Apple issue and more of an Intel issue, is the battery life on it is relatively poor. I definitely wouldn't be able to take this out and be confident that I'm going to get a good battery life. If I had meetings out and I was meeting clients or anything like that, I would always take my iPad as a backup and I'd make sure I took my power cable and everything else because this thing chews through battery. You know, I'll get... 
three to four hours of work on it, but most of the time I have it plugged in because I'm just worried that it's gonna run out of battery. Once I take it off charge, you can see it draining pretty quickly. And like I said, Intel processors aren't the most power efficient, but I just wish that it did a better job of performance management in that, si in that side of things. You see, the new M1 Max do a great job, and again, I'm getting some M1 Envy there, so just something to consider, you know, if you are using this, even though, yes, it is a very versatile machine and it can handle a lot and you get the large display and decent power from it, if you're out in the field a lot and you're away from a power outlet, then this probably isn't going to be the device for you, just because it will kill your battery. Simple as that, it will outright slaughter it. And that brings me on to another thing. And I talk about versatility with this and the fact that it is a really good productivity tool. It served me so well and I absolutely do not regret my decision to buy it because it was the tool I needed at the time and it's done everything I needed to and it continues to do so. But if you're somebody who runs Windows, and I touched on this in one of my previous videos about the MacBook Pro 16 inch, but if you need boot camp and you're using Windows, this thing is awful, like absolutely awful because once you go into Windows, any kind of power management that Apple attempts to do with this Intel processor just seems to go out the window and it chews through battery like no one's business. Like literally the fans are spinning up like crazy. You try and do any gaming on this thing, although it can kind of handle it when you're in Windows and on bootcamp, those fans will go absolutely crazy. There's an absolute chance that this thing is gonna take off my desk and just fly through the roof because those fans are going absolutely crazy. So if you're somebody who needs Windows applications and you're used to running your, you know, your Mac in bootcamp and you've had that luxury beforehand, again, this thing does a relatively poor job. The power, the, you know, the battery life drain in Windows is incredible and the fan noise that it is just insane. So it's something to be aware of. Again, if you are out and about and you need to boot into Windows on this and you're away from power supply, you're gonna run out of battery and it's just absolutely something that needs to form part of your buying decision. Now, that's not necessarily gonna be alleviated if you went for something like the M1 Max because at the moment, the Windows landscape on that is just an unknown. We don't know what's gonna be coming in the future and we have no idea what you know Microsoft are gonna do. So who knows, if you need the power and everything else, this might be the only device for you, but it's something worth knowing about because my experience using Bootcamp on this thing, it's not a good experience. Although it works and it works well, it works very hungrily and chews through your battery and it does it very noisily as well. So just something to consider. So earlier I mentioned that I like the trackpad. It's really good size, it responds really well and I absolutely adore the gestures. I'm not overly keen on the Force Touch or 3D Touch, whatever Apple are calling it in this day and age, just because it seems a little bit inconsistent. For example, when I am editing movies and I'm trying to select things and drag and drop them all over the place, sometimes I have to like long press and really push into the trackpad and then I can drop it. And other times that doesn't do the same thing. And sometimes I can just touch it and then drag and drop it and it'll do that. So, there's an inconsistent user interface there, at least for me anyway, and I don't know, maybe I'm just doing something wrong in all these years of using macOS and the gestures is just wrong. But for me, the force touch gestures just kind of get in the way a lot of the time and it drives me crazy. The other thing that I found with it as well is the trackpad's probably just a little bit too big. Now, I like large trackpads. It, anything that uses Windows just seems to always have a relatively small trackpad, although they are getting better. So I do like tra large trackpads. This thing's too big though. The amount of times you'll be typing and the palms of your thumbs or something else will just kind of knock onto the trackpad and then your cursor just goes all over the place and suddenly you're editing the top of your document or you've clicked on something else and it just becomes a bit of a messy experience. So you always end up with this sort of kind of raised typing experience. And it's one of the reasons why I use this on the back of it. It's mopped sort of stand which you can just drop down which is really handy and it stops you from hitting the trackpad all the time. So it's something just to be aware of. It's not a deal breaker by any means and you get used to that form of typing but it can be a little bit tiresome the amount of times I've had to go back and realise great I've just deleted a paragraph because I've typed something over it. Grrr. So at the end of 2020 and that's where we are at the moment and we have a whole new landscape of Apple devices that are hitting the market. Would I recommend this device? And my honest answer right now is if you can hold off, if you have, if you don't absolutely have a burning need to pick something like this up then don't do it because we're probably not that far away from having an Apple Silicon driven 16 inch MacBook. I think it's pretty much just around the corner. We're only a few months away from this sort of thing being announced and fingers crossed it is going to be an upgraded M1X or whatever they're going to go with and it will deliver some pretty outstanding results. 
So if you are not needing it as of right now, you do not need to go out and buy it because your old machine has died, then just don't do it. And to be fair, even if you did need a new machine that was meant to replace your old device, I would strongly suggest picking up something like the MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro, or even if you can, you know, you have a monitor kicking about, get the Mac Mini because it's a relatively low cost and the price of those things isn't gonna go down a massive amount by the time that this thing launches with the Apple Silicon processor. So pick one of those up as an interim period just to get you by, sell it on again, and yeah, use that money that you really keep from it to go towards a new Apple Silicon MacBook Pro 16 inch. This thing is a great device and it served me really well, but it is not without its flaws. And they are flaws that just really frustrate me, especially when you look at it from the perspective of being like a 2,600 pound machine. You know, it costs a lot of money. And when you look at the cost of the Apple Silicon devices that pretty much rival it, right now in this landscape, there is no reason pretty much at all, unless you need an Intel machine, and you want to have one of the best Intel MacBooks available, then yeah, maybe this is for you. If you're somebody who absolutely needs Windows, you need Intel because that forms part of your workflow, then it's a good device. Like I said, you take into consideration that the battery life is relatively limited, the fans will spin up, and some of the other drawbacks, then yeah, it's a bit of a pain. But for the most part, it's a really, really strong and good device. Just, it's such an uncertain time to buy one of these at the moment, and there are better machines and better bang for your buck that you can currently pick up if your workflow does not rely on Intel and purely Windows. So take that as you will, and decide whether or not you're gonna pick one of these up. Personally, I don't suggest it, but you know what, each to their own. So fingers crossed that's helped, and if it has, make sure you hit the subscribe button and really help the channel to grow. If you've got any questions at all, pop them down in the comments, I'll do my best to answer those. And in the meantime, just stay safe. We're getting to the end of the year now, and things are kicking up. So until next time, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye.